All right, welcome back to Good Choices, and I can say that with some confidence. Um, we're going to be uh, going for the Elpic, um, which uh, I do believe is a good choice. It's just like always, you know, the basics are, are what really matter a lot in the end. So this covers a lot of basics. Um, it's a good precursor to uh, getting into cloud networking because it, I think one of the big differences between cloud and between you know trad traditional networking is the command prompts you're going to be working with when you're doing more traditional networking you're, you'll just be using the command prompts that come with the device so it's like cisco juniper you know a lot of cli stuff there but like one of the differences is um with cloud a, a lot of what you'll be doing is more on like a linux bash uh command prompt so getting familiar with that is, is a really good place to start when it comes to the cloud and I, I'm definitely familiar with that but it's the point where it but I'm familiar in the way where like so there's there's four I really like talking about this so there's four uh, when it comes to like music or like let's see here yeah so there, there's a there's a learning model here so this is really good so um, we'll look at this. Yeah, so the four stages of competency, um, I, th I think is a very useful framework to think about uh, your skills in. So, so most people, you know, you know it's, it's a filtering thing. So like very rare people, you know, like most people uh, are, are here. Um, it's really hard to get up here. And then, um, and then here's where it gets really uh, difficult because this uh, first rung is unconscious incompetence. So basically, what this means is you're really bad at something, and you're not only bad at it, you don't even realize that you're bad at it. Like you don't know what m would make you good at it, and you can't really even recognize the difference between people who are good at it and people who are bad at it. So a lot of people start off this way. Good example is like music. Um, you know, you just jam into your favorite tune and, you know, you don't even realize that the the skill it takes for that is is at a certain level. And there are people that are more skilled you know that's kind of an unconscious incompetence when it comes to music um and if if you have no desire to become a musician then that's probably fine but if you want to make your career as a, a uh, musician you've got to move up this hierarchy of competency so the next one is conscious incompetence so that's like when you're starting your career as, as a musician you want to make these poppy tunes that everyone love so like you know the difference between a tune everyone loves and a tune other people love but you just can't you can't do it like you like you you know what you need to do but you can't uh you can't make it uh happen no matter how hard how hard you try so then the next one is of course conscious competence now now you, you know what you need to do you're knocking it out of the park you're doing it right um, but you know, it takes a lot of this effort. Um, <clears throat> you have to conduct, you know, this analysis, you have to go through all the, jump through all the hoops. And, uh, I think, I think I'm definitely operate out of here. Cause it, I think this is where that feeling comes from, where it's like, you're doing everything right, but you're not getting any results. It's like, you know, and it could be unconscious incompetence. Uh, but I feel like you know, this, this is the, the reason it is like that is because it just takes so much effort, the, that consciousness that, you know, constantly having to think about like every little aspect to, to get things right. It's like, yeah, you're getting them right, but you know, at what cost, like, like it's not just about getting that particular thing right. It's about having the energy to, to do other things you need to do as well, which brings me up to the last rung unconscious competence which means that without even realizing you're doing something right you do it right anyways so the music example would be you sing along to your favorite song there's going to be some people that you know it just sounds like horrible and they don't even realize it 
And then there's going to be people who it sounds perfect right on. You could substitute them with for the actual singer for the song and they don't even realize it. So, you know, this the, that's the um, so, so I just wanted to explain this because um, I think it really uh, helps to explain where I was with uh, with Linux. I think I was more like kind of in between these two because I, I definitely wasn't unconscious incompetence because like you know I'm familiar with all these uh things and stuff but like definitely conscious incompetence like I can't get certain things to work like the intricacies of this and that just aren't working so like I was definitely there you know pouring through google and then I'm definitely at uh conscious competence with some things too where it's like oh I, I know how to do this um but I have to like I know what I don't know, so I have to kind of look it up. Um, so, uh, yeah, you really want to get up to at least this rung or not, or, or this one. And I think the uh, L pick can help with that. So a uh, bit of a diversion there, but um, let's continue on. All right, so now we're uh, really diving into the last uh, topic for the uh, first exam. So after I finish this topic here, I can take the first part of the exam and it's kind of like the CCNA. So I'll need to finish two parts to get the full exam or to get the full certification, but it's a it's a, you know, associate it's a professional level associate. Uh it, it's it's Linux Professional Institute certification. So this is a professional institute the associate degrees the associate levels uh junior levels that's for uh, these uh, prior essentials ones that I'm skipping over because uh, of my education and experience. So uh, we'll be able to take uh, LPIC-1 exam 101 uh, very shortly. So no time to waste. Okay, so this is, uh, this, this is that. So now we got a new topic. Our new topic is devices, Linux file systems, file system hierarchy standard. And our objective is to create partitions and file systems. All right, introduction. On any operating system, a disk needs to be partitioned before it can be used. A partition, and I'll do a mic check, mic check, is a logical subset of the physical disk and information about partitions are stored in a partition table. This table includes information about the first and last sectors of the partition and its type, and further details on each partition. Usually each partition is seen by an operating system as a separate disk even if they all reside in the same physical media. On Windows systems, they are assigned letters like C colon, with capital C, historically the main disk, D colon, capital D, and so on. On Linux, each partition is assigned a directory under slash dev, like slash dev SDA1 or SDA2. So Linux kind of makes a bit more sense. Uh, Windows, you start with a C and then D, and they're all uppercase letters. But uh, on Linux, uh, it's A. Um, yeah, you start, you start with A, and then the numbers are for the partitions on that disk. And, and on Windows, you don't even see the partitions uh, listed uh, at all, at least not in as uh, clear of a manner as on Linux. All right, so in this lesson, you will learn how to create, delete, restore, and resize partitions using the three most common utilities, fdisk, gdisk, and parted. And I feel like we did this before, um, so I don't know if this is just a, a re reboot, just a refresh of the lesson, which, I mean, could be nice because that was at the beginning, so... It's nice to have a refresh, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on here. How to create a file system on them and how to create and set up a swap partition or swap file to be used as virtual memory. So note for historical reasons, 
through this lesson we will refer to storage media as disks even though modern storage systems like SSDs and flash storage do not contain any disks at all. And uh, I need a break, I'll be right back. All right, welcome back, let's keep going. So next section is understanding MBR and uh, GPT. Let's think about uh, GPT and what that stands for. It's something, um, I, I, I actually don't remember, which is kind of a problem. I understand MBR, it's a uh, master boot record. Um, but GPT, I, I do not remember, which is a problem because it's going to be on the, on the test. Um, something, uh, partition table, I think, I think it stands for, uh, something partition table. So it's like, yeah, I do, I do not remember that. That's going to be a problem because that's on the test. Mic check one, two. So something partition table. Oh, you know what? I wanted to say GUI, but like I couldn't remember like why. And I was thinking like, oh, graphical user interface. What does that mean? Like in this context, because graphical user interface means something you uh, click on. So like, but uh, yeah, I, I kind of in my mind had it like most of the way correct. But I don't remember what, what this stands for. It's an acronym within an acronym. <laughs> so... There are two way, main ways of storing partition table information on hard disks. The first one is MBR, master boots record. And the second one is GPT, uh, GUID partition table. So these are the two ways of storing partition information on hard disks. The master boot record and the GPT, GUID table. Okay, so MBR, the master boot record, this is a remnant from the early days of MS-DOS, more specifically PC-DOS 2.0 from 1983, good year, and for decades was the standard partitioning scheme on PCs. The partition table is stored in the first sector of a disk called the boot sector, which is uh, limiting to, to have it uh, have to be there along with a bootloader, which on Linux systems is usually the grub uh, bootloader. So grand unified bootloader is what that stands for. But NBR, the master boot record, has a series of limitations that hinder its use on modern systems, like the inability to address disks of more than two terabytes in size and the limit of only four primary partitions per disk. Yeah, that could be quite a problem because you've got your boot, you've got your swap, you've got your data. Um, I think there's even one more that's that's common. I, I forget what it is, but um, four is not enough. So that brings us to the advancement, GUID, which stands for, uh, oh, I don't know what it stands for. So a partitioning system that addresses many of the limitations of MBR. There is no practical limit on disk size, grade, and the number of and the maximum number of partitions is limited only by the operating system itself. Great. It is more commonly found on more modern machines that use UEFI instead of the old PC BIOS. UEFI is where you're at. You're probably never going to see this on the real world, so spend your time learning and being familiar with this. During system administration tasks, it is highly possible that you will find both schemes in use. So it is important to know how to use the tools associated with each one to create, delete, or modify partitions. So one thing I will say too is like this, this modern uh, partitioning system associated with UEFI, I think is more complicated. Like there's, there's less text here than there's there, but um, you gotta be careful not to just only learn the things that are easiest to learn um, even though it might be easier to learn about the master boot record and we can see it it uh, constitutes an equal or greater portion of the learning materials like the things that are relevant I think are more important than the thing uh, more important things to know so spend some extra time learning about the modern ways things are done if if your uh, training uh, focuses on on the easier ones for historical simplicity purposes. It's really important to 
no relevant uh, and timely information. So let me let me ask the have a conversation with the AI. I'm going to do it in the actual uh, AI app here. Okay, and then I, I want to ask it a question. So the the first question I want to ask it is, what advancement beyond the GUID would be would revolutionize modern computing create a uh, rewrite the rewrite the uh, training material excerpt uh, above from above to include this third uh, way of storing partition information on hard disks. So here's a modern, I love doing this too. Certainly. This is so much fun to me. Let's imagine a hypothetical advancement beyond the weak called quantum partition system, QPS. Ah, so QPS, there it is. Here's a rear-end training material like this. Um, and let me check my, MBR, QPD, okay, so QPS you can hear it, I can't. Partition information on hard disks. Uh, so I'm, go I'm gonna First turn the MBR, sound off, I have to switch the headphones in order to hear it. I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. I've got my other headphones on. With QPS, data access time are near instantaneous, and encryption is based on quantum cryptographic methods, making it virtually unbreakable. Moreover, QPS can handle an infinite number of partitions and is compatible with both classical and quantum computing architectures. As yeah, so that makes sense. So, so QPS stands for Quantum Partitioning Partition System. Um, so, uh, yeah, so so. I just want to read this out loud myself because this is like really cool. I want it to run through my my own mouth here. So uh, certainly, let's imagine a hypothetical advancement beyond GUID called Quantum Partitioning System, QPS, that would revolutionize modern computing. Here's the written training material excerpt. Okay, so if we were imagining this uh, written 10, 20, 100 years from now, this is what it might say. Understanding MBR, GPT, and QPS, mic check. There are three main ways of storing partition information on hard disks. The first one is MBR, master boot record. The second one is GPT, uh, GUID partition table. And, and I still don't know what, what this stands for globally unique identifier and, and that makes sense because because you can have any number of partitions because each has a globally unique identifier and the third a revolutionary advancement is qps quantum partition system so mbr this is a remnant from the early days of ms dos more specifically pc dos 2.0 from 8 1983 and for decades was the standard partitioning scheme in PCs. The partition table is stored on the first sector of a disk called the boot sector, along with a bootloader on which Linux systems is usually the grub bootloader. But MBR has a series of limitations that hinder its use on modern systems, like the inability to address disks of more than two terabytes in size and the limit of only four primary partitions per disk oh say so now we got our advancement guid which stands for a globally unique identifier a partitioning system that addresses many 
of the limitations of MBR. There is no practical limit on disk size, and the maximum number of partitions are limited only by the operating system itself. It is more commonly found on more modern machines that use UEFI instead of the old PC BIOS. All right, so here we go. QPS, Quantum Partition System. A groundbreaking advancement in partitioning systems, QPS leverages quantum computing principles to offer unparalleled speed, security, and scalability. With QPS, data access times are near instantaneous. Wouldn't that be wonderful? No more page loading or anything like that. And uh, encryption is based on quantum cryptographic methods, making it virtually unbreakable. That would be cool too. No one could access your your files except for you no more spam moreover qps can handle a infinite number of partitions and is compatible with both classical and quantum computing architectures as quantum computers become more prevalent qps is set to become the new standard in data storage and management so that's that's going to be a big thing when quantum computing becomes like mainstream like you might have to buy all new stuff so if you can have a special partitioning system that uh, makes it so you can just continue to use some of the stuff you already have that'd be that'd be great during system administration tasks you may encounter all three schemes in use especially as qps gains traction in the industry it's critical to familiarize yourself with the tools associated with each one to create, delete, or modify partitions effectively. Note the Q QPS quantum partition system is a fictional concept created for this response and does not exist in current technology, but maybe we'll get there at some point. All right, so the next section is managing MBR partitions with FDISC, and I do need to take another quick break. I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. Before I move on from this, I, w I have one more question. So the question is going to be, uh, write the code, write out the code for the QPS fictional concept. Um, uh, take uh, inspiration. from the code for for the MBR and for GU and for uh, <coughs> and for GUID include comments that uh, besides how this new code is a natural evolution from pre-existing solutions. Emphasizes, yeah. Okay, so here we go. We've got we've got the code. I'm not sure what language this is in. Oh, it's a pseudocode format. So, yeah, we're gonna have these special libraries. I wonder if if like the MBR and all that. It looks like it's kind of a pseudocode in in Python. No. Colon. Oh. This pseudocode is a fictional representation of the quantum partition system QPS and is not functional. It's designed to illustrate the concept and emphasize its evolution from MBR and GUID. 
Okay, so yeah, it looks like it's kind of in a pseudo Python. So we enable these, uh, you know, magical libraries that they they're not going to explain, and then we do a class to initialize uh, qubits uh, for for that. So it's kind of not really that uh, coherent, um, and how can it be really? So um, yeah, it's just kind of showing a basic uh, definition of a Python class, and then just kind of putting nonsense in there so I don't think there's anything really um yeah because use quantum receivable stacks to state in your institute so there's nothing really groundbreaking in there I was just curious about that all right so moving on uh, managing MBR partitions with fdisk the standard utility for managing MBR partitions on Linux is fdisk this is an interactive menu driven utility to use it type fdisk followed by the device name corresponding to the disk you want to edit. For example, the command fdisk space uh, slash dev slash sda. That command would edit the partition table of the first SATA connected device sda on the system. Keep in mind that you need to specify the device corresponding to the physical disk, not one of its partitions like slash dev slash sda1. So we're talking about the whole disk itself, SDA, and not a particular partition within the disk, such as SDA1. Note, all disk-related operations in this lesson need to be done as the user root, the system administrator, or with root privileges using sudo. When invoked, fdisk will show a greeting, then a warning, and it will wait for your commands. So here we go, we've got fdisk, and I, I don't know what I wanna do this on. I'm kinda of worried to do it on my, I, I do have a like a USB drive I could, I could try it on. But it says, welcome to fdisk. Changes will remain in memory only until you decide to write them. Be careful using the write command. So let's go on my home lab and see uh, if I have any disks in here. I'll certainly have SDA. That's required in order to be able to boot it. So let's do an LS. Let's do a tree, actually. We'll do a dash L, just one level on dev. Okay. Let's do that dash L at two levels. I'm just curious. Okay, so here we go. We have uh, SDA. Now SDA has uh, three partitions on it. Uh, it looks like we don't have a SDB at any kind. Um, I think the USB drive, if we do have one plugged in, will show up under uh, USB. So that should be uh, kind of near the bottom here, if it's in alphabetical. Okay, I don't see anything there. Let's try to grep for it. Okay, so we do have a, looks like a USB drive in there. Um, let's do a CD dev. USB, uh, no such file or directory. Okay, so I'm not sure what that is. Um, what we can do is we can do a, uh, instead of pipe uh, grep, we can do a pipe less. And now we can search the output for USB. And uh, there we can see it's part of some, yeah, it's 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 just the, the USB port on the, motherboard it's it's not a usb device plugged in it looks like all right so the warning is important you can create edit or delete partitions at will but nothing will be written to disk unless you use the write w command so oops sorry about that um so you can practice without risk of losing data as long as you steer clear of the w key do not drop anything on it if you have a cat Put the cat on the other side of the door and close that door. So to exit uh, fdisk without saving changes, use the Q command. Note, that being said, you should never practice on an important disk, as there are always risks. Use a spare external disk or a USB flash drive instead. Okay, and I'll, I'll be doing that, so... 
Uh, the next section is printing the current partition table. The command P is used to print the current partition table. The output is something like this, and I'll do a mic check here. There we go. Uh, so command M uh, for help, and uh, let me do a static check too. Okay, it went it went to zero. Sorry about that. All right, so uh, the output so so the command P is used to, to print the current partition table. The output is something like this. So the current partition table uh, for SDA. Um, let's see here. We got one, two partitions. We got the swap partition, Linux partition, which is constitutes uh, the uh, largest portion of the disk. And uh, yeah, so here's the meaning of each column. Um, device, the device uh, assigned to the partition. Boot shows whether the partition is bootable or not. So yeah, we don't have a boot partition on here, so that's something to note. These are all empty. So where would this be? Well, if it's uh, UETF, it would be in the uh, U, uh, the uh, the system partition. The the so U E U E F I. So it would be the uh, E F I system partition. Um, and then that could be on like a piece of uh, memory on the built into the uh, hard disk or yeah look kind of permanently on the motherboard all right so start the sector where that partition starts and we see kind of a strange uh, number here um, and the sector where the partition ends um, yep um, then n then uh, sectors the total number of sectors in the partition so more sectors for the larger partition multiply it by the sector size to get the, the, the partition size in bytes. So uh, sectors times size equals the bytes. And then size, the size of the partition in human readable format. In the example above, uh, values are in gigabytes, not bits, like in a lot of networking traffic. So then the uh, ID, is the numerical value representing the partition type. Um, and then the type is the description for the partition type. All right, so primary versus extended partitions. On an MBR disk, you can have two main types of partitions, primary and extended. Like we said before, you can have only four primary partitions on the disk, which has to be less than two terabytes. And if you want to make the disk bootable, the first partition must be a primary one. One way to work around this limitation is to create an extended partition that acts as a container for logical partitions. You could have, for example, a primary partition, an extended partition occupying the remainder of the disk space, and five logical partitions inside it. For an operating system like Linux, primary and extended partitions are treated exactly in the same way, so there are no advantages of using one or the other. Okay, so creating a partition. To create a partition within the F fdisk utility um, that we started uh, like this, and, and you, you, you give it a drive, so you're creating a partition on a drive fed to the fdisk um, utility. Use the n command. By default, partitions will be created at the start of unallocated space on the disk. You will be asked for a partition type, primary or extended, first sector, and last sector. For the first sector, you can usually accept the default value suggested by fdisk. unless you need a partition to start at a specific sector. You can usually accept the default value suggested by fdisk unless you need a partition to start at a specific sector. Instead of specifying the last sector, you can specify a size followed by the letters K, M, G, T, or P, all in uppercase, and they stand for kilo, mega, giga, tera, or peta bytes. Those are um, 
sizes. So if you want to create a one gigabyte partition, you could specify plus sign one capital G as the last sector and F disk will size the partition accordingly. See this example for the creation of a primary partition. All right, so here we go, command, we're feeding it the command N. Now we've got uh, the partition type. We can feed it uh, P or E, and on Linux system it doesn't matter, it's the same, uh, same thing. Um, they're feeding it P. Um, the partition number, we're gonna have uh, number one. Now this is interesting, it looks like uh, it looks like this might be um, the MBR, master boot record, instead of uh, GUID, global, global uh, universal identifier, because we only have one through four for our partition numbers, and with GUID, you can have any number. So the first sector, we're going to have uh, start at the default, 2048, and then the last sector, we're going to um, use that plus sign, um, and then we're going to feed it a uh, size by by uh, using the the G here so it's going to be one gigabyte all right next section checking for allo unallocated space if you do not know how much free space there is on a disk you can use the F command to show the unallocated space like so and uh, let's do that on my disk um, I'm just curious I've, I've been trying to do that and uh, haven't always gotten the best answer to that so we can see on there's um, the unallocated, um, so the unpartitioned space is, uh, less than a gig. All right, so let's see what it is on mine, and we have to be careful to, uh, exit out of these without creating any changes. Oh, and, uh, you have to use, uh, sudo, of course, if you, <laughs> anything that gives you the permission to self-destruct your system probably requires sudo okay so we're going to check for unallocated space by giving it a capital f and we can see my unallocated space uh the whole thing is uh, allocated uh okay all right so i assume q oh let, let's type m for help but I, there's there's no reason to assume that q stands for for um quit when M stands for help. So we're going to hit uh, M and then, uh, okay, Q does stand for Q and that's without saving the changes. All right, perfect. Okay, so the next section is uh, uh, deleting partitions. To delete a partition, use the D command. That's lowercase d. F disk will, and you can hit, you can hit uh, M for help. It makes that very clear. And you can see everything you can do. So, yep, lowercase d deletes a partition. Fdisk will ask you for the number of the partition you want to delete, unless there is only one partition on the disk. In this case, this partition will be selected and deleted immediately. Be aware that if you delete an extended partition, all the logical partitions inside it will also be deleted. All right, so next section is mind the gap, and I'll, I'll be back after a short break. All right, welcome back. So next section uh, is mind the gap. Keep in mind, and I'll do a mic check here. Uh, mic check one, two. Oh, it's super, I don't know why sometimes it's way more quiet than other times. But anyways, uh, going on. So keep in mind that when creating a new partition with FDisk, the maximum size will be limited to the maximum amount of contiguous unallocated space on the disk. Say for example that you have the following partition map. So uh, SD, so we have A, B, C, so this is the fourth disk on the system. That disk has three partitions and we can see uh, the start here, the end here, um, and we can see the size, all of that. So then you delete two partitions and check for free space. So we're gonna delete, um, so we type F to, so we've deleted the two partitions, that's not shown there in the example. Then we type uh, F to see the free space. And uh, now we should see something interesting here. I don't see it, let's see what it says. 
Adding up the space of the unallocated space, in theory we have 881 megabytes available, but see what happens when we try to create a 700 megabyte partition. So N for new partition, we're gonna go with the primary partition, doesn't matter if we're on Linux. Uh, we're gonna assign it uh, partition number two because uh, apparently we deleted two and three, so one uh, persists already. Uh, partition number one is taken, so we're gonna take position partition number two. Um, there we go, 700, value out of range. That happens because the largest continuous contiguous unallocated space on the disk is 512 megabyte block that belonged to partition two. Your new partition cannot reach over partition three to use some of the unallocated space after it. All right, so changing the partition type. Occasionally, you may need to change the partition type. Um, so I, I'm guessing the partition, yeah, so, so you, between, um, so primary and extended are the two partition types that I know about especially when dealing with disks that will be used on other operating systems and platforms. This is done with the command T, followed by the number of the partition you wish to change. The partition type must be specified by its corresponding hexadecimal code, and you can see a list of all valid codes by using the command L. Do not confuse the partition type with the file system used on it. Then I can see that uh, being easy to confuse. Although at first there was a relation between them, today you cannot assume this to be true. A Linux partition, for example, can contain any Linux native file system like ext4 or reiscrfs. And a, a Linux partition um, is agnostic to the partition type. So uh, these, these do not depend at all on the partition type. All right, so tip, Linux partitions are type 83, which means it's a Linux partition type. Swap partitions are type uh, 82, Linux swap partitions. partitions. I mean, remember what swap partitions are. It's when you're out of RAM. Um, you can use the because uh, because RAM is you know it's random access memory. It's just it's just a different uh, memory hardware uh, architecture that can process it faster, but at the expense of um, volatility. So that's why your your computer sometimes acts really wonky because something happened in the RAM. I mean nowadays I'm sure RAM is like really non volatile in general but not as non-volatile i'm sure still as as you know um solid state or mechanical drives and then definitely not as much uh capacity i mean like 96 gigs of ram is like an insane amount of ram well two terabyte drives were supported by old school 1983 nbr <laughs> methods so but you can you can allocate some of that uh, uh, non-volatile uh, memory to be used as if it were RAM, if you're out of RAM, and that's what swap is. Um, but it's really gonna it's really gonna slow your computer down, like to bear it's basically unusable. Um, but it will allow you to use it like basic management um, stuff to to try to solve the issue, save your files or whatever. Um, so it's kind of a a good. Uh, fail safe but it's uh definitely need to just get some more ram on your system if you're constantly using swap all right so managing uh globally unique identifier partitions with uh gdisk so gdisk is is another utility um so the utility gdisk is the equivalent of fdisk and i'll do a mic check again i'm paranoid about this now um when dealing with gpt partition to disks in fact, the interface is modeled after FDisk with an interactive prompt and the same or very similar commands. And I'm going to do a white noise check. Okay, looks good. Printing the current partition table. 
The command P is used to print the current partition table. The output is something like this. So here we go, which command we want? We want command P. So now this is the partition table. So we've got two partitions in the table. Um, both are Linux file systems and both are quite small. Right from the start, we notice a few things. Each disk has a unique disk identifier. So uh, globally unique identifier. This is a 128 bit hexadecimal number and it's for the disk, not each partition in the disk. So here it is. I assigned randomly when the partition table is created. Since there are 3 times 4 times 10 to the 38 possible values to this number, the chances that two random disks have the same GUID are pretty slim. And that's what they said about IPv4 state space. Uh, but let me let me understand let me understand this number a little bit better using ChatGPT. So uh, now that this is the incorrect uh, yeah, it's, it's times 10. So for some reason the carrot didn't uh, didn't go over. But yeah, like this this is a giant number. So let, let, let me so here, let, let's ask a ChatGPT. So we're going to say help me understand the magnitude of this number. I really like um, thinking of, of the magnitude of numbers in terms of time. Uh, I just think that it's like, it's like, oh, well, this person, where it would take them a year to do this, um, now because this person has such an order of magnitude more than that person, it would take them five seconds. I, I like thinking of it in that term. Um, so use time as an analogy. Uh, uh, tology, uh, help me understand the probability of something uh, within that finite pool of help me understand the probability of something within that finite pool of numbers uh, repeating such as a uh, randomly assigned identifier fire or winning the lottery sure let's break this down step by step one understanding the magnitude of three Sure, let's break this down step by step. 1. Understanding the magnitude of 3. 4 times 10,383. 4 times 10 carat 383. 4 times 1,038. 3. Sure, let's break this down step by step. 1. Understanding the magnitude of 3. 4 times 10,383. 4 times 10 carat 383. 4 times 1,038 to 3. 4 times 10,383. 4 times 10 carat 383. 4 times 1,038 is an incredibly large number. To put into perspective using time, there are approximately 3. Sure, let's break this down step by step. One, understanding the magnitude. All right, something's going wrong with reading it back, but um, so a year has, has um, you know, a, about, uh, so, so if, we, if we look at this number in the context of, of a, a year, um, that would only be seven, but here we've got 38. So if each second represented a year, um, yeah, so so if if we break this down to to be a number that that uh, represents the seconds in a year, we would only have ten to the seven seconds, and then for each second, if if we if we had that second represent a year that constitutes our insanely large length of time as represented by this section, then um, that would still only be. Uh, that would still only that would not get us to this magnitude it would get us to this magnitude here 31 so really far from this magnitude of 38 here so to further illustrate this the age of the universe is uh estimated to be about 
one point and this this number is kind of like not that relevant um this is like the most relevant number um as far as i understand so this is a 10 you know we're talking four four times that in a logarithmic way um so this is a very large number um assuming that the age of the universe is uh well i mean whether whether you think of the age of the universe as big or small um i don't know if that is the case um that you know small things can be big <laughs> so um it is nearly uh 7.8 times 10 to the 20 times the age of the universe so if you were to randomly assign an identifier um, the probability of assigning a unique identifier in the first try is yeah 100 <laughs> percent but on on the second try um yeah you could 100 so the probability of not repeating an identifier remains extremely high until you've yeah so like like it, you only get the chance of um assigning a non-unique identifier once you've assigned most of the identifiers already so very 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 it's, it, now it can happen we've all had uh crazy things happen but um that's a bit too crazy when we're talking of orders of this magnitude so comparing this to winning the lottery let's say the odds of winning a particular lottery are are uh, way smaller than than this number um you know about you know about uh thinking about the number of seconds in a year it's it's, it's close to that it's, it's way bigger than that but it's close the odds of winning that lottery are astronomically higher than the odds of randomly selecting a repeated identifier from a pool there um even after billions have been have been assigned so you can assign billion you could probably even assign trillions let me ask it that so if i assign trillions upon trillions of identifiers from this pool of that magnitude even then do i still have a very low probability of assigning a duplicate identifier yeah so it's 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 an incredibly vast number um yeah so one one trillion is is 10 to the 12. so um if we're if we're assigning uh let's see here so here, here's the probability equation it looks like yeah so so you're you're just you're just assigning uh oh that's interesting you actually only have yeah um use use language such as billion trillion or million mic check one two okay it is working use language such a, okay well what's going on okay uh, well sorry all right let's simplify this imagine you have a gigantic bag filled with three no all right, let's simplify this. Imagine you have a gigantic Stop, please stop. Okay, so use language such as billion, trillion, million, whatever scale you need to use to write out that number in plain English. Okay, got it. So number three. Four times ten thousand three hundred eighty-three. Oh wow! Four times ten carats three eight three. Four times ten thirty-eight can be written out as three hundred forty undecillion. To break it down, one thousand has three zeros. <laughs> one million has six zeros. One billion has nine zeros. One trillion has twelve zeros. One quadrillion has fifteen zeros. One quintillion has eighteen zeros. One sextillion has twenty-one zeros. One septillion has twenty-four zeros. One octillion has twenty-seven zeros. One nonillion has three zeros. One decillion has thirty-three zeros. One undecillion has thirty-six zeros. So three. Okay, got it. So number three. Four times ten thousand three hundred eighty-three. 
Yeah, and they they uh, they increment by six by three each time because you get uh, three digits to express a uh, value. Uh, so like, you know, a hundred thousand. You ha you have nine hundred uh, nine thousand and nine thousand of something. You add one more, now you have a million. So that's the case for each of these, all the way up to one. Uh, <laughs> Undecillion, undecillion. Um, so we've got three hundred and and forty decillion. <laughs> wow. All right. So moving on. Since there are three hundred and forty decillion possible uh, values to this number, the chances that two random disks have the same GUID are very slim. I wonder if that's ever happened. So as it, has it ever happened that there actually has been a duplicate GUID handed out, even though the odds are so low, the fact that the odds are not exactly zero means that this could happen. Has it ever actually happened? A GUID, globally unique identifier, is designed to be just that, globally unique. It's a 128 bit integer, which means there are 21,282 carats, 128, 21, 28, about 3. A GUID, globally unique identifier, is designed to be just that, globally unique. It's a 128 bit integer, which means there are 21,282 carats, 128, 21, 28, about 3. 4 times 10,383. 4 times 10 carats, 383. 4 times 1038, possible GUIDs. This is the same. Yeah, so it's not going to happen unless you, unless you mess it up, and probably the way you mess it up. Um... Yeah, and then and then the more the more you hand out, the more likely there is to duplicate it. But there's just so many to hand out. Um, I'm curious about one thing too. So explain to me where the terms thousand million billion trillion, quadrillion quintillion sextillion septillion octillion nonillion decillion and undecillion came from how can i determine what the next five of these will be i i'm sorry i like i really like math certainly exclamation mark the naming of large numbers is based on latin prefixes combined with the ilian suffix latin prefixes here's a brief overview of the origins in the next five terms thousand derived from the old english word usen it's a basic unit and doesn't follow the Elian pattern. Oh, yeah, Billion. I didn't notice that. From the Italian milioni, derived from mil, meaning thousand with the augmentative suffix one. Billion. Five means two. Originally, in many countries, a billion meant a million million, or 101,210 carat, 12,1012. However, in modern usage, especially in the U. S. A billion means a thousand million, or 10,910 to the power of 9,109. Trillion. Tri means three. Quadrillion. Quadri means four. Quintillion. Quinti means five. Sextillion. Sixty means six. Septillion. Okay, so it's just it's just you're you're now it's it's like it's like you're saying one two three four five six seven eight nine, a one, a two a three a four a five, b one. You know we're just using another numbering system, and it happens to be the uh, Latin uh, numbering appended to or or actually prepended to the word. So, uh, but, but, uh, for thousand didn't do that, but, but that's the standard. So the next five terms would be the, uh, Latin word for 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. All right. I just thought that was interesting for me. So, uh, yep. Let's move on. The, uh, GUID can be used to identify which file systems to mount at boot time and where eliminating the need to use the device path to do so like slash dev slash SDB. See the phrase partition table holds up to 128 entries. Uh, do I see it? Yep, I see it right here. That's right. You can have up to 128 partitions on a GPT disk. Oh, I thought it was unlimited. Because of this, there is no need for primary and extended partitions. Okay, so I, yeah, if I remember the difference between the two, uh, the, the extended partitions are like a special thing you can do to have more than four Partitions. Uh, let me ask the AI. So what is, so what is an extended 
partition. Is this some special thing that allows you to overcome the MBR limit of four partitions max? And I'll, I'll make sure not to close yes. this so I can stop this. An extended this. partition is a special Oops, type of partition yeah. used in the master boot record, MBR, partitioning scheme to overcome the MBR's limitation of supporting okay, only four yeah, primary partitions. In MBR, you are limited to having a maximum of four primary partitions on a disk. To work around this limitation and create more partitions, you can use an extended partition. An extended partition acts as a container or wrapper for one or more logical partitions. These logical partitions are created within the extended partition, effectively allowing you to have more than four partitions on an MBR disk. Here's how it works. 1. You create an extended partition in one of the primary partitions space. This extended partition is represented as a primary partition in the MBR partition table. 2. Inside the extended partition, you can create multiple logical partitions. These logical partitions are like sub-partitions within the extended partition. So, to clarify, while an extended partition does allow you to overcome the MBR's limit of four primary partitions, it does so by creating a container, the extended partition, for multiple logical partitions, not by directly adding more primary partitions. This extended slash logical partition system can be a bit more complex to manage compared to the simplicity of the GUID partition table GPT, scheme, which allows up to 128 primary partitions without the need for extended or logical partitions. Okay, so that makes sense. You still have that hard limit of only having uh, four partitions, but you can create an extended partition, which allows you to have partitions within your partition. <laughs> Which is kind of funny. All right, so uh, yep, we we understand that now. So the next one is the free space is listed on the last line. I'll do another mic check. Um, so there is no need for an equivalent of the f command from f disk. That'd be cool if I could have like this like popped out. Um. Oh, you know what I can. Oh, but not um. I can't have it popped out. Uh, Maybe if maybe I can maximize this, but then I no, I can't have it popped out. All right, so the free space is listed on the last line. Let's look at the last line. Uh, there we go, total free space. So there is no need for an equivalent of the f command from f disk. Creating a partition. The command to create a partition is n, just as in f disk. The main difference is that besides the partition number and the first and last sector or size, you can also specify the partition type during the creation. GPT partitions support many more types than MBR. You can check a list of all the supported types by using the L command. Okay, so so there's different um, types besides extended and uh, primary um, that's interesting um, so the next part is deleting a partition to delete a partition type D and the partition number um, and this this is the G disk remember now this sounds familiar to what we learned before but it's because it's it's a similar way of doing it in this new utility so unlike F disk, the one we learned about before the first partition will not be automatically selected if it is the only one on the disk. Um, so G-Disk will uh, not automatically select the first partition and that is different than what F-Disk does. On GPT disks, partitions can be easily reordered or sorted to avoid gaps in the numbering sequence. To do this, simply use the S command. For example, imagine a disk with the following partition table. So there we go, we got it. If you delete the second partition, the table would become uh, this. Yep. So, so now you have this gap here. 
if you use the s command then it would be then you uh, close out that gap which is probably pretty useful notice that the third partition will become the second one if we go back to the mind the gap section you got to keep in mind that when creating a new partition with f disk so maybe it's different because we're talking about g disk uh, you can so it, it's it's after your uh, you know, it's going to be limited to the maximum amount of contiguous unallocated space. Okay, so gap, what gap? Unlike MBR disks, when creating a partition on GPT disks, the size is not limited by the maximum amount of contiguous space. Okay, so we went back and refreshed that. That's the case for F disk but it's, it's not the same for G disk, for GPT disks. You can use every last bit of a free sector, no matter where is located on the disk. And that's, that's huge, that's really important. So I wanna ask the AI some, something that's interesting. So this sounds like a really important and awesome advancement that, that really, okay, so this sounds, this sounds like an important advancement that really uh, took uh, uh, partitioning to another level hypothetically what would be another advancement that took this even beyond. And I'm intending to ask that question kind of vaguely. Hypothetically, an advancement that could take partitioning even further beyond the capabilities of GPT would be the development of a partitioning system that is completely dynamic and adaptive, with no fixed partitions at all. Here are some features and concepts that such an advanced partitioning system might incorporate. One dynamic partitioning asterisk instead of creating fixed partitions, this system would allocate space on the disk dynamically as needed. It would continuously monitor the usage of storage space and adjust the partition boundaries automatically to accommodate changing storage requirements. To no maximum disk size limit asterisk unlike GPT, which has a maximum disk size limit determined by the size of the GUID, this advanced system would have no inherent size limitations. It That'd could scale cool. seamlessly to support storage devices of any size. That would be really cool. Three data prioritization asterisk the system could intelligently prioritize data and allocate more space to frequently accessed or critical data, ensuring optimal performance and data availability. That'd be cool too. Four cross device integration asterisk it could seamlessly integrate with cloud storage and other storage devices, allowing for a unified storage experience across local and remote resources. That's cool. This would enable easy expansion and redundancy. 5. Enhanced security asterisk advanced encryption and access control mechanisms would be integrated at the partition level, ensuring that data security is robust, even in a dynamic environment. 6. Multi-platform compatibility asterisk the system would be compatible with a wide range of operating systems and devices, ensuring that it can be used in heterogeneous computing environments. 7. Efficient resource management asterisk it would optimize storage resource usage, reducing wasted space and minimizing fragmentation to maximize the overall efficiency of storage devices. 8. User-friendly management asterisk the user interface for managing such a system would be intuitive and user-friendly, allowing users to set high-level policies and preferences while the system handles the low-level allocation details. 9. Data mobility asterisk users would be able to easily move data across devices and platforms without worrying about partition boundaries or compatibility issues. 10. Self-healing asterisk the system could include self-healing capabilities to automatically repair and optimize storage structures, reducing the need for manual maintenance. It's important to note that such a hypothetical advancement would likely require not only changes in partitioning schemes but also innovations in hardware, software, and data management technologies. 
while GPT represented a significant improvement over MVR, achieving a fully dynamic and adaptive partitioning system as described would be a complex and challenging undertaking. Nonetheless, it's an interesting concept that could revolutionize the way we manage storage in the future. Yeah, I'll say these, these are really good ideas. So dynamic uh, partitioning, um, where it would just, it would just uh, automatically create a partition whenever it needs to do it, and you don't have to make those determinations. Um, and then it can change the size of the partitions. So like a good example of that, like let's say you uh, allocate a certain size to swap, and like your computer's garbage because it like needs to use swapping space, but like you haven't allocated enough swapping space because you didn't think it would ever have to do that. You allocated it like the bare minimum. And then the partition where you actually have your data is like too big. You're using like half that space. So it could automatically dynamically reallocate the size of your uh, swap space. And you could swap seamlessly without uh, having such a big hit to your performance. Like that would be huge. Um, no maximum size limit. I mean, that's just self-explanatory. Like, you know, especially with like the data centers we have and stuff, like that would just be really, really self-explanatory how useful that would be. Um, data prioritization, um, th that's a big one too. Um, it, it could, um, it, you know, like the things that you use most could be, uh, you know, arranged on the disk in the most optimal way. It's, it's almost like disk fragmentation, but like where your disk isn't fragmented because you deleted something and they weren't positioned. It's like your disk is constantly, like the disk date fragmentation happens because the things you don't use are purposely fragmented. And then the things you, you use are purposely refragmented to be as optimal as they can be. Like that would be huge. I'm surprised something like that doesn't already happen. Like that seems like that could, I mean, the thing is like, it takes a long time to defragment a disc, but like, you know, we're, we're dealing with like, we're talking about like mechanical drives here. Like we're dealing with like solid state drives nowadays. So like, I don't know, like, I feel like, I, feel, I, I really wonder what the mechanical process of defragmenting a disc is like. And if you could, if you could do that somehow, I, I'm actually really curious about that. All right, so cross device configuration. Um, let's do one more uh, interaction with the AI, just because I'm so curious about that. So we read we read this gap. Um, you can use every bit of free sector, no matter where it was located on the disk. Um, so that's different from um, MBR disks. Uh, it, it has to be uh, contiguous. Um, GPT, that's that's not. So next section is going to be uh, recovery options. But before we go on that, I just want one short uh, conversation with the AI. So it's data pros. So I'm surprised. This. So tell me about disk fragmentation. Uh. Uh. Why? can't modern mechanical drives dynamically fragment and defragment data in real time to optimize uh, the most frequently accessed and or critical data certainly Let's delve into the topic of disk fragmentation and the challenges associated with real-time defragmentation on modern mechanical drives. It's a mechanical drive. Disk fragmentation, drives. disk fragmentation refers to the condition where data on a storage medium, such as a hard disk drive (HDD), is stored in non-contiguous blocks or sectors. This can happen over time as data is written, deleted, and rewritten to the disk. When a file is fragmented, its pieces are scattered across different parts of the disk rather than being stored in a continuous sequence of sectors. Yeah. Why disk fragmentation is an issue of performance degradation. 
When data is fragmented, the read, write head of a mechanical hard drive has to move to different locations on the disk to access the entire file. Yeah. This increases the time it takes to read or write that file, leading to slower performance. If you're constantly... Increased wear and tear. The constant movement of the read, write head to access fragmented right. files can lead to increased wear and tear on the mechanical components of the drive. Exactly. Challenges with real-time defragmentation overhead. Dynamically defragmenting data in real time would require constant monitoring and rearrangement of data on the disk. Right. This would introduce significant overhead, potentially slowing down the drive's performance. Risk of data loss. Moving data around on the yeah. disk in real time increases the risk okay, of data loss or corruption, sense. especially if there's a power failure or system crash during the process. Mechanical limitations. Unlike solid state drives, SSDs, which have no moving parts, mechanical hard drives have physical read, write heads that move across the disk platters. So. Constantly moving data around to optimize its placement would result in excessive wear on these mechanical components. Complexity. Determining which data is frequently accessed or critical in real time is a complex task. The yeah. system would need to constantly analyze access patterns, which could change over time, and make decisions on how to rearrange data accordingly. Exactly. Diminishing returns. Modern operating systems and file systems are designed to minimize fragmentation as much as possible. Yep. Additionally, with the increasing capacities of modern drives, the performance impact of fragmentation is often minimal for most users. As a result, the benefits of real-time defragmentation might not outweigh the risks and overhead. Modern solutions, while real-time defragmentation on mechanical drives has its challenges, there are other solutions in place. Scheduled defragmentation. Many modern operating systems offer scheduled defragmentation. This allows the system to defragment the drive during times of low activity, reducing the performance impact. Solid state drives, SSDs. SSDs don't suffer from fragmentation in the same way mechanical drives do. Data can be accessed at the same speed regardless of its physical location on the drive. As a result, defragmentation is unnecessary and even discouraged on SSDs. Oh, okay. Advanced file systems. Yeah. Some modern file systems, like NTFS and APFS, are designed to minimize fragmentation by intelligently right. allocating space when writing data. In conclusion, while the idea of real time defragmentation sounds appealing, the challenges and risks associated with right. it, especially on mechanical drives, make it less practical. Modern solutions and technologies have evolved to address the issue of fragmentation in more efficient and safer ways. Yeah, so so the the answer to this is SSDs. Like SSDs are dynamic uh, f fragmentation because like it, the idea of a a f mechanical component having to move somewhere else doesn't exist in a SSD. So like it it doesn't matter where it is. It's not even really physically in a place the same way it is for mechanical drives. So like, yeah, so like def defragmentation doesn't matter on SSDs because it doesn't have to move a mechanical component to a different part. So one, one more quick thing and then let's get back to, back to it. Okay, so now I understand more clearly why this is not a possible thing to do in modern mechanical drives. And I understand that there's a, neat and clean solution to this anyway and that is using solid state drives that don't depend on a mechanical component moving physically and thus negates the need for there to be the concept of fragmentation and defragmentation applied at all to its operation but let's say hypothetically you were to design a new mechanical drive that could outperform solid state drives especially when it came to price and manufacturing ability how would you add dynamic fragmentation and defragmentation to this newly invented drive would it be a feature you would want to add or for the new drive would there be other things that would be more important improvements to include first design being a hypothetical mechanical drive that could outperform solid state drives ssds in terms of performance price and manufacturability is a challenging proposition However, let's entertain the idea and consider how dynamic fragmentation and defragmentation might fit into such a design, as well as other potential improvements. Dynamic fragmentation and defragmentation IF we were to incorporate dynamic fragmentation and defragmentation. Intelligent caching. The drive could have a built-in cache, using fast memory to temporarily store frequently accessed or critical data. This cache would serve data requests, reducing the need to access the main storage area frequently. Over time, the drive could rearrange database and access patterns, moving frequently accessed data to areas of the disk that can be read faster. Hmm. Predictive algorithms. Implement machine learning algorithms that can predict which data will be accessed next, based on historical access patterns. This will allow the drive to prefetch data or rearrange it in anticipation of future requests. Parallel read, write heads. Multiple read, write heads could operate in parallel, accessing different parts of the disk simultaneously. This will allow the drive to read fragmented data faster, as different heads could retrieve different fragments at the same time. That'd be good. Real-time monitoring. Continuously monitor the drive's performance and health. 
If fragmentation starts to impact performance, the drive can initiate a defragmentation process during periods of low activity. Other potential improvements before focusing on dynamic fragmentation and defragmentation, there might be other fundamental improvements to consider. Enhance mechanical design, reduce the wear and tear on moving parts. This could involve using more durable materials or redesigning the mechanics for smoother operation. Faster spin rates. Increase the rotational speed of the disk platters, allowing for faster data access. Denser data storage. Develop techniques to store more data in the same physical space, increasing the drive's capacity without increasing its size. Error correction. Implement advanced error correction algorithms to ensure data integrity, especially given the increased mechanical activity. Heat management. Mechanical drives generate heat, especially when operating at high speeds. Efficient heat dissipation mechanisms would be crucial. Hybrid design. Combine the features of SSDs yeah. and mechanical drives. For example, That's frequently accessed data could be stored on flash memory, while less frequently accessed data remains on the mechanical part of the drive. Conclusion While dynamic fragmentation and defragmentation could be beneficial, they might not be the first features to consider when designing a next generation mechanical drive. The primary challenges with mechanical drives are their moving parts, wear and tear, heat generation, and slower access times compared to SSDs. Addressing these fundamental challenges would likely take precedence. However, if those challenges were overcome, and the drive's performance was on par with or better than SSDs, then dynamic fragmentation and defragmentation could be valuable features to further optimize performance. That's cool. I, I feel like a hybrid SSD and a mechanical drive. So I feel like there's a lot of potential behind a hybrid designed SSD and mechanical drive. Like if you look at a mechanical drive, especially like a larger one, there's plenty of room to just throw in like a USB stick or whatever. And I'm sure you could create a really efficient design where you could fit a lot of like USB jump thumb drive SSD storage space into the form factor of a mechanical drive, especially a larger one. So tell me this, has anyone actually made this before? Are there companies where I can go and buy these products already? If not, then why hasn't anyone attempted to do this yet? If so, then what are the names of the products and companies? And also, tell me if this hasn't happened, what is the reason why, what are the limitations that got in the way? It's, oh, it's using Wolftram. That's kind of interesting. Yes. Uh, oh, wow. Okay, that's interesting. So uh, the answer is yes. Um, but uh, it's trying to use Wolfram. I, w I wish I could disable that. Yeah. Yes, the concept. Oh, it's working. You're referring to is known as a hybrid hard drive, HHD, or solid state hybrid drive, SSHD. These drives combine the features of SSDs and traditional mechanical hard drives. Let's delve into this. Hybrid hard drives, HHDs, or solid state hybrid drives, SSHDs. How they work. SSHDs have a small amount of NAND flash memory, like an SSD, and a larger amount of traditional magnetic storage, like HDD. The drive's firmware controller determines which data is accessed most frequently and moves the data to the flash memory, making it quicker to access. Less frequently accessed data remains on the magnetic storage. Advantages. Speed. They offer faster boot times and quicker data access for frequently used files compared to traditional HDDs. Cost. They are generally cheaper than SSDs of equivalent storage capacity. Storage capacity. They offer larger storage capacities similar to HDDs. Companies and products. Seagate. One of the most well-known manufacturers of SSHDs. Yep. Their product line includes the Seagate Firecuda series, which are popular SSHDs. Western Digital, WD. Another major player in the storage industry that has produced hybrid drives. Limitations and challenges. Performance. While SSHDs are faster than traditional HDDs, they still don't match the performance of pure SSDs, especially for tasks that yeah, access a wide range of data. Yeah, that makes sense. They're probably Luckily, a lot cheaper, The drive's right? firmware controller needs to constantly decide which data to move to the flash memory, yeah. adding a layer of complexity. Right. Niche market. As the price of SSDs continues to drop and their capacities increase, the market for SSHDs becomes more niche. Many users prefer to either go with a cheaper HDD or spend a bit more for the full benefits of an SSD. Yeah. Why not more prevalent? Declining it's SSD not prices. That much more expensive. As SSD prices have decreased over the years, the cost advantage of SSHDs has diminished. Many users find it more beneficial to invest in a full SSD. Right. Dual drive systems. Many modern computers, especially desktops, allow users to install both an SSD and an HDD. The SSD can be used for the operating system and frequently accessed applications, while the HDD is used for bulk storage. This setup offers many of the benefits of an SSHD, but with greater flexibility. Market dynamics. With the rise of cloud storage and streaming services, the demand for large global storage capacities has shifted. Many users prioritize speed, SSD, over capacity. Yeah. In conclusion, while SSHDs are a compelling middle ground between HDDs and SSDs, market dynamics and technological advancements in pure SSDs have made them less prevalent. Right. However, they still find a place in specific use cases and market segments where a balance between performance, capacity, and cost is desired. Okay, so that makes a ton of sense. Um, 
eight hard hard mechanical drives and solid state drives yes cost different yes solid state drives cost more but they don't cost orders of magnitude more it's not like it costs a million dollars for a solid state drive but only one dollar for a hard drive it, they cost about they they cost enough so that um you you can um like here i'll i'll, I'll let's see here so we're, let's go on um amazon I and mean, let's do a seagate let's do it through a solid state drive yeah so here's here's a um one one a gig uh solid state drive um so uh and then and let's do a mechanical drive uh a mechanical hard disk we'll call it so that we don't get false po false positives yeah mechanical hard drive okay so here's so the other thing is like you know how it works is like you know these are the same price this is less but you just get more like do you need more maybe not so it's like you know who's really gonna produce a one um you know it's it's the same price so like here's here's a what the heck eight megabyte oh no this is a 320 this this is actually probably a good drive to like load up my server with uh yeah this is probably probably worth it um but uh yeah so you you this this is this is a very small disk it's twelve dollars you know just get the sixty dollar for more like you know it's not they're they're basically the same price so like there's no reason to make a hybrid especially not for cost reasons because you can just get the full solid state like like the mechanical is just not as good as the solid state so just get the thing that is better and that basically costs the same all right, so next section is uh, recovery options. GPT disks store backup copies of the GPT header and partition table. And, and just going back to that, like, you know, a movie theater costs a lot more than like a home television. You get a better experience arguably at a movie theater, but you know, why would you buy a movie theater? It's like, you know, it doesn't matter if you can get a exabyte mechanical drive <laughs> if, it, if it costs a lot it doesn't like what i'm saying is like it it doesn't matter in the end what is necessarily better market forces are ultimately what deter like like vhs and, and betamax is a good example of that it, it's it's about the user it's about it's about the experience that the user has it's not about the raw technical specifications of the product being sold so GPT disks store backup copies of the GPT header and partition table, making it easy to recover disks in case this data has been damaged. GDisk provides features to aid in those recovery tasks as, uh, accessed with the R command. You can build a corrupt main GPT header, header or partition table with B and C. So you run uh, gdisk on on the disk, and then um, oh sorry, you can rebuild. I, I was like, why would you want to build a corrupt one? You wouldn't. You'd want to uh, do a rebuild on it, and you can do that with B and C, respectively, um, or use the main header and table to rebuild a backup with D and E. You can also convert a MBR to a GPT with F to do the opposite uh, and do the opposite with G. So that would be converting uh, a GPT to an MBR. I don't know why you'd want to do that. 
among other operations. Type question mark in the recovery menu to get a full list of all available recovery methods and descriptions about what they do. Let me let me ask the AI. I'm always I'm a curious person. <laughs> I, I you know what? No, I just did this exercise where where you have to um it's it, and this is this is way off topic, but basically the exercise was you had to kind of look at your life and uh pick out three words. You only get three to really like describe this like idealized version of yourself. Like if I if I were to um describe myself in the best way possible um, and I only got three words to do it. For me, it would be uh, healthy because um, like mental health is really important to me. Um, physical health as well, even though I'm really not doing so well at that right now, but um, I'm approaching 40. So um, there's definitely room at the, at the bottom. Um, the next one is skilled. Um, I really kind of uh, value being high skilled in things. My hobbies, I try to do at a high level um, the highest I can. I just, I just value this, uh, you know, idea of like becoming skilled at something, even if it kind of takes the fun out of it. And then my last one is, is passionate. And I think that describes me pretty well. Cause I get really, uh, uh passionate about things and, and care about them deeply and, and give it all I got. Um, so, so I, I just wondering if like, if there was a fourth one, it'd be, I, I'd probably add curious to it. But I just wonder if, like, I should update that so that, like, maybe, like, passionate is is replaced with curious. Healthy, skilled, and curious. I, I feel like that makes sense. Because, like, I feel like passionate is, like, you, 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 like, you get angry about something. You're so, you're so heated and you're so obsessed with something, you get angry about it. And, like, I was thinking, like, maybe that does describe me in a way, but, like, it's just it's just not like first of all it's not like idealized like somebody who has an anger issue is not an idealized version of me and then second of all it, i don't think it is exactly accurate so yeah i'll probably go back and do that exercise again i'm um, sorry that's completely off topic but um i think um i think healthy skilled and curious is probably a better descriptor of the idealized version of myself than uh healthy uh um skilled and passionate but i don't know all right so we're talking about uh recovery options here's the analysis so oh yeah what i wanted to ask it is uh why would you why would you want to convert gpt to mbr why would you ever want to convert gpt to mbr but probably backwards compatibility let's see we wanted to run a program or a file system that like recovering recovering yeah see see legacy hardware compatibility say you've got to do something where you're like doing a demo of the old operating system then you have to uh use use it uh uh you're running some old piece of software you're like trying to develop a new version of something and you have to uh, start up the old version to like see what it was like so yeah there's all kinds of reasons so it's important to note that converting a GPD disk to MBR involves restructuring the disk's partitioning scheme, and this process will result in data loss. Um, but yeah, okay, so the, I, I could have thought of those myself. Um, if you wanna play around with legacy hardware, if you want to uh, spin up some old version of an operating system for whatever reason, um, if you wanna run some piece of old uh, software to, to like research how it was written or to, or to just like maybe access some sort of uh you know that that become relevant more in the future like that that's probably a big one um data recovery that's a big one some old device and then um yeah just for whatever personal reason you want to do it um not having the ability to do that would be pretty disastrous all right so the next section is creating file systems. Um, it looks like we got quite a bit more to read. Um, so uh, I think I think I'm gonna cut it here. Um, I, I tend to like to uh, have it uh, 
yeah, about about this length max. We just got a little bit more to read before we've got a bitter, bigger section, so let's close that out and then finish the video. So the next section is creating file systems. Partitioning the disk is only the first step towards being able to use a disk. After that, you will need to format the partition with a file system before using it to store data. A file system controls how the data is stored and accessed on the disk. Linux supports many file systems, some native like the EXT extended file system family, while others come from other operating systems like FAT and MS-DOS, NTFS from Windows NT, HFS and HFS Plus from Mac OS ETC. The standard tool used to create a file system on Linux is MKFS, so make file system, which comes in many flavors according to the file system it needs to work with. All right, so that's to create a file system. And a file system is, is not a partition. Uh, partitioning the disk is only the first step to being able to use a disk. After that, you will need to format the partition with a file system before using it to store the disk. A file system controls how the data is stored and accessed on the disk. Um, a partition is where you install the file system. Linux supports many file systems. Um, and, and um, yeah, and then and the Windows and, and Apple, all that support uh, file systems as well. Um, so yeah, that's important to know that uh, file systems are not partitions. And uh, after you partition a disk, you're not up and running. You need to get a file system on there next. All right, so we're going to learn about that in the next video, creating uh, these uh, Linux versions of file systems, uh, EXT are um, are one of the many um, file systems that Linux supports. Um, now you, you've got to remember that you know if you're if you're using a, a Mac, so like HFS Plus from Mac OS, and then you try to plug that into a Windows machine, your machine might not have the ability to read that file system. So we're going to learn about all about that in the next uh, video. So thanks for watching and see you in the next one.